Good evening and welcome to PAUSE. I'm your host, Dr. Phil Hoffman, and joining us this evening, we'll have someone who's an expert in all sorts of things happening in Johnson County and Warrensburg area. That's coming up right now on PAUSE. And welcome back to PAUSE. Again, I'm your host, Dr. Phil Hoffman, and joining us today is Mr. Jack Miles, who is the editor of the Warrensburg Star Journal. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Phil. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, you have spent quite a bit of your life as a reporter and a writer and a journalist, and you were mentioning to me earlier, you've been around in St. Louis and Kansas City and that sort of thing. What have you seen in the newspaper business in terms of changes over your career? Well. My career stretches back full time to 1980, so a few things, yeah, a few I things. I, I, I still have uh, scars on my hand from using an X-Acto knife to uh, put the paper together. If you want me to, I can go into a whole explanation of how that was, but basically uh, you got down to photocopies of strips of news coming out of a quasi-computer compared to what we have today, and then you'd cut it with a knife. Then you'd wax it and you'd lay it on a sheet of paper, you'd shoot it with a photograph to get it on the press. Now, of course, everything is done in the computer. Big changes in those in, in that regard. Photography, you know, I used to go out and I'd take photographs, and I'd do it in film. And we would roll our own film on the canisters, wow. and we'd put in the camera, and you'd shoot off 36 shots without any even knowing what you had. Now I can look in my digital camera and I can see the picture, whether that was a good shot or not, whether the lighting was good or not, but you didn't have those kind of options. That. So those are huge changes in terms of the technology and in terms of the personnel, uh, seeing some changes there with uh, people who are more, I guess, interested in doing uh, shows like this, television shows, et cetera, because they're much more visual than, than television is, and they're much more aligned to the internet than they are to the print product. So those are pretty dramatic changes for newspapers. I've seen the size and numbers of newspapers shrink dramatically through the years. And it certainly is something where you see that happening to, to the industry. And I've, I've heard various you know arguments, well, it's because newspapers were too slow to react to the internet all the way down to, you know, it's it's just a simple matter of economics and, and it's happening in every slice of media. So it, it, from your seat on, on the side of, of being in the journalism business, what does that do to the quality of the journalism? Is the size and the shape and the changing nature of the, the industry, is it hurting journalism? Or do we still have, in your view, good quality journalism even in this situation? I think we still have good quality journalism. Whether it can continue and for how long is another matter. Uh, there was a time when you would get the very best and brightest coming out of school who wanted to be journalists, who wanted to make a difference in their community. It's now harder to find those kinds of people as they uh, very intelligently look at the job market and say, what are my odds of becoming a print journalist and getting somewhere with that? And the odds have decreased unless you've got, uh, as I've told some uh, younger people, unless you've got an angle. Um, I was talking to one woman and her angle was, well, I can really do great things with the web. Now this is 10 years ago, mm. but that was a new thing for some newspapers. And so she really had that down and she was working in that direction. I trust that when she went on, she was able to do something with that. But as far as people coming out of school and saying, I want to be a print journalist, well, we've even seen the programs in colleges shrinking. There are fewer of them, and uh, they're working in a whole lot of other areas other than print. So it's hard to attract the best and brightest to do, to do the job now, and the expectations are high uh, for what we do get. So there's a lot of pressure on the journalists who do come into the profession. The one thing I can tell them is, if you go into print journalism now, there's no reason that cannot be leveraged into a different type of job as long as you're smart enough and open enough to the idea of working with some of the digital things that are available because having a great foundation, learning how to write, learning how to do all the mechanics will pay dividends in the future. But 
you know, it's kind of hard uh, when you're coming out of school to look in terms of the long term and how things will benefit you. Well, and certainly, I mean, uh, one thing I think that always worries students is you see poll after poll after poll, the worst jobs kind of polls, and mm -hmm. I see a lot of that stuff. And of course, journalist is almost always in that list of the worst jobs. And, uh, you know, I remember my days in television news, and it's a tough job, there's no question. It's always been a tough job. It's never been an easy job. Sure. But I definitely think that there's that sense of not only is it a tough job, but also the financial rewards may or may not necessarily be there. And the expectations and the view, I think, of society of journalists uh, is probably not the greatest at this moment anyway in, in time. Well, that's been something that's been ongoing now for many years, right. uh, starting with Spiro Agnew. and. He just thought everybody was out to get him. Never mind that they were out to get him because he wasn't paying his taxes. And, <laughs> and he was the one who uh, who uh, came up with the term nattering nabobs mm -hmm. of negativity that uh, some people still remember. I remember it. And um, that kind of thinking, blame the media. If I do something wrong, I'll blame the media and it will stick. I think he helped uh, get that ball rolling. And Richard Nixon certainly followed. Not that he did anything wrong, uh, but... You know, he and Spiro helped get the idea going that it, it's the media's fault. They shouldn't be blaming us or looking at us or paying attention to us. And Gary Hart was another when he invited uh, invited journalists to follow him around, like you're going to find anything. Well, they did. Yeah. So, yeah, it's blaming the media. And it's a tough. It, it really, if you think about it, I because I, I used to get this thrown at me all the time as a television reporter is, well, you only come and cover the bad things. You never cover when good things happen, which wasn't true, but people would say that to us oftentimes. And so I think that's another piece of that, and you know, the, the reason why people sometimes have a negative view of, of news in general is because, well, it's not news if everything goes right today and everybody's happy. Well, it, there are a lot of different definitions for news, including within the news industry, but I, I think one is telling somebody something they didn't know. And uh, it, it, the average person does go to work every day and does try to do a good job and then comes home, and there's nothing unusual about that. But if something unusual happens, then that becomes news, and that's hard for the average person to understand. Fortunately, we're in community news here in Johnson County with our paper, so Last night was the hog roast for the Johnson County Fair Association. I was glad to do it. It was fun. I went out, took some pictures, talked to people. That's what a community journalist does. So I hope we don't hear too much of the, you guys only cover bad news, at least on the community level. Now, mm -hmm. the tougher job, of course, would be for the St. Louis Post or the Kansas City Star when they've got such a big community and so many hog roasts and things going on where you know, maybe it does appear that they're only focusing on the negative. but in that size of a community, in a, in a metro daily, it is a lot harder to be so community oriented. And when you talk about the idea of a community newspaper, give us some, some delineation of what does that entail and how does that differ from what you know, would not be a community newspaper? Uh, size, scope. In this town, the hog roast is news. In Kansas City, the hog roast is not news, <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. because there are so many of them, so many different things going on with church potlucks and things like that that I will cover, because that, I figure, is part of our community life. I don't have any problem covering that. I enjoy it. Um, the Kansas City Star, I don't see how they could possibly even consider doing that, although they might do some. They might send some people out. There are just so many things, because they are a big city metro, that they have to cover. They have to go out and cover the national news. I don't. Um, if there's a big national story, uh, we'll cover it if there's a local angle to the national story. Okay, the state story, if there's a local angle to the state story. My audience can get that news anywhere. They can't get the local angle, that's why I might provide that in a story. But if they want to get a story about uh, why uh, Obama is not going to Scalia's funeral, that's not worth, we're, they're not coming to our paper for that. They right. can go to get that off television. So that, that I think is the difference. Now one of the things I know that has changed a lot, especially with younger consumers of news, is when you ask them, well, where do you get your news? Oftentimes the answer is Facebook, mm -hmm. social media of some kind. And uh, first of all, part, part of me is kind of always curious about that because I'm like, you see the byline 
there on Facebook where this is from the Post or the Times right. or whatever, but they, they, they sort of will say, well, I get my news from Facebook. Um, but then the flip side of that is suddenly now the New York Times is equal to Mint News or something like that. So they become, perceptually, I think, they become the same thing in the user's eyes, and maybe they're not. There's no doubt about that. It is a great concern because a lot of things that go up on the internet are not vetted. They are someone's opinion. And opinion posing as news is a real problem where, you know, we have an obligation to try to get this right, not show our opinions unless we clearly mark them as opinions. Another concern piggybacking off of that idea is, like you said, there will be bylines for the St. Louis Post, or there might be bylines for our paper. Uh, people don't realize that it's coming so much from a newspaper. And if they continue to go get their news online and they don't go to the source, eventually the source might dry up. And uh, you know, we can see across the industry that there have been many newspapers that have folded. There have been many newsrooms that, that have shrunk. And as they shrink because of lack of subscribers, uh, because they're going on the internet, at some point, it may get to it may get to be that the news isn't going to be there. You'll get all opinions, but you won't really have news. Now that, to me, should be a great concern, not just for newspapers or any other medium in terms of, gee, will we make money? That's not the concern. The greater concern to me is democracy itself. What happens? What replaces us? Google is not hiring a whole bunch of reporters to go out and do news. Facebook is not hiring reporters to do news. They're getting it from other sources. Some of it's us, some of it's, most of it's the Kansas, uh, the Kansas City Star, or the New York Times, or the Wall Street Journal. But if those papers aren't there, then who's doing the reporting? And, and if somewhere down the line someone says, okay, well, we'll hire a couple of reporters. Oh my gosh, that's a couple of reporters. And what's their news background? So it's a, it's a great concern to me. Well, and I know one of the things that's happening right now in television news especially is this notion of the newsroom is not important anymore. You basically have sort of independent contractors, if you will, who have a laptop and they're out covering stories. And um, I think the concern of folks like me and, and some folks I used to work with are that that culture of having an editor, of having colleagues in the newsroom with whom you have a relationship and with whom you are maybe a little afraid of your editor because if you don't turn something in that meets the standard, it'll get rejected. And in television news anyway, nowadays, it seems that that's not always the case anymore, that it's sort of you're kind of out on your own and you don't really have that relationship in the newsroom. Is that happening in, in print journalism? Not to my knowledge. Of course, we've always had freelancers. And, right. and they can go out and write stories, but they're going to be vetted. And you do have a newsroom that gets hold of the story, and there are people there still talking and interconnecting with each other. So it's not a total um, freelance situation where you basically have one editor and 15 people working out and doing freelancers. Although there is some, uh, there are some magazines that do things like that, where they have an editor who assigns freelancers, brings all the stuff in house, and then edits it, and. The idea of not being able to talk with your peers and think things out and, gee, this guy told me this. Does this really, really sound right to you? What do you think? Should I go ahead and put this in? Who do you bounce that off? Well, you might bounce it off the editor, but it'd be nicer to have, uh, more professional, I think, to have several people who as a team can look at your story and work with you on your story. So you have more of a team editing, team writing, team journalism approach. So, yeah. If that's happening in print, I'm not aware of it in terms of newspapers. Well, and certainly it's hard for you to check your own biases. It's much easier if you're in a team environment. Somebody could say, well, wait a minute. You know, you, you can't phrase this this way. Sure. And like you said, it's, it's a team, team effort. When I uh, have my stories read, I read them. I think I've got them all right. I give them to two or three more people. I will give them to the receptionist mm -hmm. uh, if she's got time and say, would you give me, uh, take a look at this, proof it, let me know what you think. So, Well, one of the things I learned early on when I started trying to be a reporter was that 
you go to an event or you're covering something and you know what happened. You have it in your head because you were there and you talked to everybody. And But uh, early on, especially, I had difficulty figuring out how to get that information down in a way that the reader understood it. And so I'd leave out critical details or the timeline wouldn't be right or things like that. So I think that's one of the things you're talking about is when you have a profession uh, of journalists understanding that context of not only getting it right, but also how to tell a story so that the reader can understand it and follow it. Uh, I know that seems maybe simplistic, but it actually is more complicated than people might expect. The way it was explained to me by a really grungy old editor, he'd be about my age now. <laughs> his name was Rube Yellington, and he was uh, editor. That's not really his name. That's really his name. He Rube was Yellington. Rube Yelvington. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and, well, Rube uh, was, I think they call it the... Uh, the protest over at uh, University of Missouri, mm -hmm. uh, the 50 group, whatever they mm -hmm. were, mm -hmm. he was part of the 50 group, one of the original members of that mm. group. He was a, he was a student, uh, I guess, senator or whatever they had there at the time, and he helped uh, advocate for uh, making sure blacks could attend a university. Well, he was my first editor at my first full-time job in uh, Mascuda, Illinois, and uh, Rube was... Wow. He was great at explaining things, and um, he was editor, like I said, of the Metro East Journal, which was a daily at that time in, in East St. Louis, Illinois. And the way he would explain things to me when I came back from a story or from a, an assignment, he'd say, "Why are you writing this now? It looks like you're just sitting down. You should be writing this on the way back." Right. Uh, and, and so that's a help. And then I'd write a story, and he'd say, "Well, what does that mean? Who?" Do, who cares? What did you? What does this mean to anybody? And what he explained to me was what he called the bar stool rule. I want you to picture yourself, Jack. You're sitting down at a bar. Me, I don't drink very much, or hardly ever. But I want you to picture yourself sitting at a bar, and the guy next to you says, "What happened?" Just tell him what happened. Don't spend a whole bunch of time with flourishes and trying to make it sound flowery. Just tell him the damn story. Was kind of Rube's attitude, and so yeah, you know, that was very helpful to try to remember. Who you're talking to, you're talking to the average guy. He just wants to know what happened. He doesn't want a whole bunch of flowers and bells. So when you put together a newspaper, as you do on, on a daily basis, hence the name, right? Yeah. You put together the newspaper, and you go through that process every day, and you're back at the bottom of the hill again the next day. Mm -hmm. um, what's that look like? Uh, uh, you know, the, the process from beginning to end, just to get to one day's newspaper. Can you kind of walk us through the steps of what typically happens? Wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is there a typical, really? Um, yeah. We have an idea of what's going to happen, the, happen each day. We know certain meetings will take place, or at least they're supposed to. Sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've got people assigned to those different stories. I've got a police scanner sitting right at my desk. I listen to that to hear if something's going on there, whether it's a fire or an accident. Fortunately, it is, doesn't happen too often, very fortunately. Um, I've got stories coming in from the night before. Basically what I do, and because I'm a writer editor, um, I'm doing more than what you would get at the normal, uh, like at, at a larger daily. So I'll come in and I'll have stories to write too. At some point in the day, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to start reading what other people have written. And I will also start putting together pages. I'll write, like first thing in the morning, I, I usually come in and I will write an editorial. Uh, and I will put together the column and the letters and, and the cartoon and the backward glances that we have on the editorial page, and I'll get that done. Um, I'll read a couple of other people's stories, try to write some of my stories. In the meantime, I'm starting to put together my front page based on the importance, at least in my opinion, of where stories should be running. I don't get too many complaints about why wasn't this on page one and page three, but it's a small community. There aren't a whole lot of gigantic stories happening and that that's a good thing I mm -hmm. think usually so I'll start putting those together and I'll talk with people and I'll get a page done and I'll give it to a couple of people and say hey, you read this you read this because it's a small newsroom uh, and we'll turn it back into the um, back shop to take care of some of the uh, 
uh, things that need to be done to get it to a pre-press point so it goes on the press. Uh, I'll edit the photographs. Um, you know, there, there's just a lot of things that at a smaller paper you wouldn't do at a larger paper. It's not a union, folks. Mm -hmm. You don't have just one job. You've got a whole lot of things to do. I think one of the, it uh, seems to me, one of the unique things about your situation, too, is I was fortunate enough to take a tour through Johnson County climb of the, of the paper. And you guys have a, a pretty large printing facility right there. Right. In, in your and I my understanding is that's becoming less and less common at newspapers it's becoming less common at a lot of newspapers including ours mm -hmm. now you've said a couple of things and I'm not sure how attuned you are as to what's going on our newspaper was five times a week until early this year we've gone to three times a week now so we're Tuesday Thursday Saturday okay our press we're getting ready to sell mm -hmm. now we are owned by St. Joseph News Press Gazette, okay? Uh, good family-owned company. They've got a fantastic modern press there. They can do our paper like that. And so we've started sending it up there, and they've been printing it and bringing it back down here. It's a little problem with logistics. I think those things have been you know, worked out. It's not really a problem now. Uh, so we're getting good quality printing. We're getting it done in-house in terms of our own companies doing it. Uh, we've got, uh, we don't have to worry about the press, which although it was very handy having it right there, we're talking about a press that where it breaks down now. There's problems with trying to get parts for a press that's mm. that old. We had some great printers. I think they did a fantastic job with the uh, piece of equipment that they had. They, they knew what they were doing and they did a good job. And I think another company may be able to get some more life out of it. But at some point, we just had to step back and say, it's just not, it's just not going to cut it for us, especially when we've got a modern press in St. Joe that can do things a lot quicker, a, a lot better. So. So now you have the whole moving things around as opposed to having the convenience of thing right there, but you're away from it breaking down and right. those sorts of and, things. And as far as moving things around, not so much. I mean, here, the button's pressed. It's now in St. Joe. Mm. So that's not too yeah. much. Now, we do yeah. have to physically get the newspapers back here, right. but that's really the, the only manipulation that had to go and on. And it's not like St. Joe's on the other side of the world. So, right, yeah. right. So when you look at, at, at the current process of creating newspapers and the current environment of what's happening in terms of the business practices, what, what do you see happening? Uh, be a prognosticator now for me, Jack. What, what do you see happening in the future for the, the newspaper industry? You know, if I had that information, yeah. we could probably make a lot of good money <laughs> on Wall Street. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Um, Newspapers are going more online. I don't know how that model works out in terms of being able to pay people to do mm -hmm. the job of going out and reporting, going out and selling advertising. Um, it would have to be much scaled down because I don't think the print, uh, the, the online revenue matches up to the print revenue at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and that being the case, if you're looking at a much reduced uh, future for for um, oh gosh advertising on the web it's 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 just not going to pay the freight that I think now is necessary in terms of having reporters uh, and having ad staff to go do the job I hope I'm wrong but I you know I there's no way for me to know I know that the newspaper has been heading in that direction for 20 years and I've been looking at it from very early on and saying how do we monetize this mm -hmm. how is this really going to pay off newspapers were giving themselves away free you'd go online and get well I could read the Kansas City Star we had I finally and I kept telling my one of my publishers this and I and I kept telling him you know how does this work and one day his light went off because somebody called him and said hey I'm canceling my subscription because I can get you online. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it took that. It, it, you know, uh, a prophet is without honor in his own mm -hmm. country, right? right. <laughs> now we have a paywall. So you can look at a few things. For example, if there are obituaries and you're from out of town, I don't think it's fair to make you pay that. So that, that was all right. So you can go on and you can, online and you can get uh, a look at several of the issues in, case, in cases like that. Um, but in terms of news, if you really want to have community news and know what's going on in your town, then you need to subscribe. Well, and it's you know it's uh, the culture of, of 
the internet, it seems these days that everything is supposed to be free. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that you've got the giving it away years ago combined with people now are used to and expect things to be free. So it does, it is one of those things where you look at it, you think, well, where's this going? Yes. This trend going? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going anywhere good <laughs> from, from, a, from a standpoint of the consumer right now. It probably seems like, hey, that's great. But in the end, it's going to, I think, go the same way as the online sales tax. Mm -hmm. Why nobody wants to pay the online sales tax. Mm -hmm. I don't think they realize by not paying the online sales tax, when you hit a pothole, you may hit it again because there won't be anybody to fill it because you're not paying the taxes to fill the pothole. The, the government, local government and our county commission will tell you they'd like to have the sales tax revenue that they're not getting. Mm -hmm. And there's no excuse for it. There's none. Several states right now collect a sales tax. Missouri's lawmakers will not collect that sales tax. So how can you say that you're pro-business, you're pro-Main Street business, and at the same time say, you have to pay the tax but the big internet sales company, they don't have to pay that tax. Mm. That's an uneven playing field that they've created. And sorry, it does no, kind of go right. with the whole thing about the, uh, about the newspapers and people wanting them free. You can get it free for a while, but somewhere along the line, you're gonna pay for it in one right. way or another. Well, Jack, thank you. That's the good news. That was delivered good news? To, to us by Jack today <laughs> about the, the future of the news industry. But as long as we got folks like you working at it, hopefully there's a way to out, out of it. Thank you for joining us. I'm Phil Hoffman. Thanks for watching. Pause.